All right. Well, I think I'll, we'll go ahead and get started. There will probably be a few more people who, are, who will filter in here, but uh, welcome to everybody who is joining us tonight. Thank you for joining us. My name is Brian Gibson, and I'm one of the editors at GIA Publications, uh, and I'm joined this evening by Dr. Sandy Goldie. We're thrilled to have her with us. Uh, she is actually, uh, she's actually published several books with um, Meredith Music, and for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, Meredith Music was acquired by GIA Publications about a year ago, so GIA Publications is now Meredith Music's parent company, but Meredith Music maintains its own catalog uh, and, and brand and identity. Uh, so we're thrilled to be featuring some Meredith authors as part of our GIA you know, webinar series. Uh, before we go ahead and get started, I just wanted to cover a few logistical items. Um, first and foremost, we are recording this. So if, uh, if you know someone who wasn't able to attend or you would just like to go back and review, we're going to post the webinar to our YouTube, our GIA YouTube and Facebook pages um, probably in a, in a few days from now. It'll take us a couple of days to get those rendered and up online. Um, I already mentioned this, but for those who haven't yet, go ahead and put your name and where you teach and what you teach uh, over in the chat area just so that we can see who we have attending tonight. Um, the structure of the webinar is very simple. I'll give a brief introduction here, and then I'm going to turn things over to uh, to Sandy to speak for about 45 minutes, and then we're going to reserve the last 15 minutes or so for a Q&A time with Sandy and then a few of the co-authors uh, on the book that she'll be speaking about tonight. Um, and so if you have any questions, please put those in the Q&A area that's down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, that's just a good place for me to kind of keep track of those, and then I'll, I'll field those questions to Sandy at, in our last 15 minutes. And then also wanted to mention that uh, as, as part of this webinar, we are offering a promo code on the book, uh, Rehearsing the High School Orchestra. And that's uh, the, the promo code is Orchestra15 for 15% 15 off the book. Uh, and that goes through October 1st. And I'll put all this information over in the chat uh, after I get done with my introduction here so that you all can uh, easily get to that link and have that promo code. Um, and now I just want to take a quick moment to introduce uh, Sandy. Dr. Sandy Goldie is Director of Music Education at Virginia Commonwealth University. She has enjoyed working with students of all ages and is an active guest conductor and clinician, working with many honors orchestras, including the South Carolina Allstate Orchestra. She has worked as a public school orchestra teacher for 14 years and in higher education for the past nine years. She's an active guest speaker at state, national, and international conferences, including ASTA, Midwest Clinic, TMEA, and others. She has been state president of ASTA in both Virginia and South Carolina, is currently VMEA president of higher education, the Southern Collegiate Representative in NAFME, and the associate editor-in-chief of the American String Teacher Journal. Her recent book, Rehearsing the Middle School Orchestra, went to number one in orchestra on Amazon last year, which is just remarkable. We're really excited about that. And her new book, which she'll be speaking about tonight, is Rehearsing the High School Orchestra, and that was just released this past summer. Uh, so with that, I would like to turn things over to uh, Dr. Goldie. All right. Good evening, everybody. I'm so excited that you're joining us, and we uh, cannot wait to share with you uh, some of the information from Rehearsing the High School Orchestra. Um, this book, um, this we started this project over this past year, um, and uh, there were so many things that were going crazy with the pandemic and our classes um, shutting down. But the one good thing that really inspired me this year is something that I want to share with you. And that is this project of um, trying to get some of the most inspirational high school teachers I know from around the country to open up and share genuinely and honestly, throw open the doors to their classrooms and just share some of their stories, their ideas, their strategies. And so um, tonight I wanna share some of those with you. And also I want to talk to you about some of your ideas for your upcoming school year as well. So we, are t we were so excited. Um, and um, maybe you know some of these people, I hope you do. Creston Heron, Laura Mulligan Thomas, David Eccles, uh, Kathy Hudnell, Chris Selby, Scott Laird, Charles Laux, Gail Barnes, Kurt Moser, and Kurt Moss. And some of them are actually going to join us for the Q&A, so we're going to be really excited about that as well. So um, 
Today, I want to share some things from the book, but I also want to look at what this new school year is going to look like for us and how these things are relevant to you. And to me, really every year, I want to be the first one to wish you a happy new year because we are all going back to school and it's going to look hopefully way different than last year. And so um, I think it's really our chance to uh, write a beautiful story, the story that we want to live for our students and for ourselves this year. And hopefully tonight, you'll pick up some tips and strategies that you can take back with you. So we'll look a little bit at what our goals are, uh, what your goals are for the school year, some of our favorite repertoire. Um, I know we're all looking for those great pieces that are going to help us just motivate the kids and light them on fire to want to really dig in and play their instruments and make music again together and uh, talk about some strategies that uh, this book is full of really interesting ideas for, on things like warm up and intonation and tone and ensemble uh, playing together expression recruiting and community building and then we'll go through with some Q&A. So I want this to be as interactive as a webinar possibly can be so um, first thing, I know um, some of the repertoire that is my favorites, but what I always love is to hear what some other people's favorites are. So, would you, in the chat, um, think about a piece over um, last year or the year before, last two years, is there a piece that your kids just really love, that you and your students really love, they just ate it up? and you just love doing that piece, would you put that piece in the chat? Share with us a piece of repertoire that you really love that you've done in the last year or two, or even before that, that you, you can give to somebody as they're looking to start the school year. Ah, Fantasia, I think by Thomas Tallis, yes. All right, I know there's some others out there. Um, what what are your, some of your just really favorite ones? Because we know when students are loving the music, they're really motivated. Oh, look at this uh, Ancient Wonder Suite, Celtic Canon, wonderful. Okay, um, and so one thing that's always interesting to me is to see what's working for different people and then getting online and just really researching those pieces. And so one thing we did in this book is I asked that same question to each of our um, authors and what happened was uh, through interviews oh look we still got these coming in star of county down yes perseus um keep sharing those but i asked um i asked these authors that too i asked out of all the pieces in the world grade four through six what have been some of your very favorite pieces and they gave me their top 10 list and so all of those for each of these people um, are in the book but then what I did is I just oh I love a pirate's legend too uh, my students eat up anything by uh, Soon He Newbolt <laughs> as well um, and Brian Ballages and Kurt Mosier they just love those things so I went through and I analyzed all their list and uh, and wanted to see were there any recurring um, composers or pieces that lots of them mention and so here are some when um, I went through and analyzed out of all 11 um, people, uh, some that they really like. If you see one of these that you've done and you really like it too, throw it in the chat. Which ones of these have you done that you really like? Sweet for Strings by Rudder, Fanfare and Frippery, Overture to the Wind. Of course, lots of those Mendelssohn symphonias, um, Dvorak, Serenade, Fantasia, um, the uh, We're in Serenade, Concerto Grosso, number one by Bloch. Um, all of these were mentioned multiple times uh, by multiple different people. So it's interesting to me to see um, middle school, but when I judge, I love hearing groups play Overture to the Wind. Yes, I remember our, our uh, all county orchestra playing Overture to the Wind and just loving it. Um, there's a whole list like this in the rehearsing the middle school orchestra too. So if you're really looking for some grade one, two, or three, because not all high schools are playing grades four, five, and six. It's not about 
how hard the music is about what a great experience we can give to kids, right? Um, so there's some really uh, good gems in there. And I was also curious about who their um, most cited composers were. So Dvorak and Vaughn Williams, they um, uh, were mentioned a lot. And uh, close behind, uh, it's really interesting uh, balance between some of the, um, you know, the old favorites like Bach but, and Bloch and um, Mendelssohn, but also, you know, um, Richard Stefan, Carol Nunez, uh, Brian Balmages, um, all of these folks as well. If you have a favorite composer that you just end up playing lots and lots of stuff by them, throw it in the chat. Who's your favorite, um, who's your favorite composer? It doesn't have to be any particular grade level of music. We'll give you, are any of these hitting home, home with you guys as well? Never heard of some of the names on here. Yeah, I, I, I there were some that I had not, and I had to look them up, and I was like, wow, those are great. I'm going to get on that with my youth orchestra or with some of my, oh, yeah, Meyer, Phillips, Spada. Um, these are on, most of these are on the middle school list as well. It's fantastic. Yeah. All right, and so then um, I also was just interested in, okay, who were the most cited favorite arrangers? You know, sometimes you, you just, even if you don't know the piece, if you know it's a good arranger, you're like, okay, anything that, pro oh, I love Hofelt, yes. Um, you, can, you can look up that arranger and know you're going to be in good hands. Um, we, Robert McCashin, Kurt Moss, who's actually here with us, was in the top four. Merle J. Isaac, Sandra Dachau. Who are your favorite arrangers? Put those over there in the chat. If you have a favorite arranger, Merle J. Isaac is always playable. Yes, he was on the he was on the list as well. A lot of people mentioned him, and especially in the middle school list. Sandra Dachau. Yep. So um, if you're looking for inspiration, there's tons of list. Um, tons of lists in this book that will give you some new inspiration and some new ideas. Um, so um, we are actually going to ask you to continue to share ideas throughout this, but before we move on to the nitty gritty, and thank you for sharing those ideas because the whole idea behind this book is that, you know, too often we orchestra teachers operate in isolation with our greatest insights remaining hidden behind the closed doors of our classrooms or our computer screens. But when we open up and share ideas with each other, we can really become inspired. And I can tell you after reading all of these different ideas, I just could not wait to get in front of kids and try them out. And so um, we're gonna raffle off this book. If you need something to really jumpstart your year, um, then this, this will give you um, give you something that you can read about um, and get some ideas of other people. Um, and these these folks who were who were contributors to this book, um, I not only respect them because they do excellent work and their programs are excellent, but um, and they do more than teach music. And that really hit home to me as I read all the different contributions and the different parts. These are teachers that do more than teach music. They actually impact students' lives. And they their ensembles not only make great music, but their ensembles make great people. And, um, and so I'm really excited to share uh, some of the glimpses that you can get in these things. So before we jump into the warm-up and intonation ideas and ensemble ideas and recruiting or community building, we're all going to need to be doing a good bit of this this year, aren't we? A lot of us probably are going to feel like this is going to be one of our big priorities as we come back from not being able to gather in, in the same physical space, a lot of us, and to make music. But how do we go about really uh, rebuilding our programs and re, um, rebuilding our communities? So um, I hope you will enjoy some of those as well. A couple of things really stood out to me, big picture things from all of the um, all of the panelists, and that is they were all governed. In the sections where I asked them about what's your goal, what's your overall philosophy about why you're doing this? And by the way, if you wanna be inspired 
by why people are doing this and the importance of the work that we're doing that only we can do than read some of these philosophies. Um, but they were all governed very passionately um, by specific quotes or ideas or things that guided their work. And um, it, it was not lackadaisical. They had taken the time to really think about what they were trying to accomplish, what they want kids to walk away from. And so um, if you are thinking about this new year, what do we learn from the pandemic? What do we take away from, from it? What is it that music education is and what it can be? And how is that different now than before? What is it that we're really trying to accomplish with kids? This is a great chance for that reset. Um, and so I urge you to, do, to look in yourself and to see some of those things as well. But um, hearing some quotes about what other people were saying really made me think deeply about some things. So, for instance, um, you know, Laura Mulligan Thomas, who's with us today, is uh, one of her guiding uh, quotes that she just really goes back to over and over is high achievement always takes place within the framework of high expectations. And you can see, um, you know, taking a program that only had eight or nine kids in it and then building it into this powerhouse orchestra, how, um, you know, high achievement and excellence built that positive energy in that community into something that is truly amazing that now, you know, the whole community supports and everybody wants to be a part of. Um, Kurt Mosher is really guided by his, this quote that he, um, he really thinks of himself and especially the part that is while music is a beautiful art form, the subject matter is never more important than the subject itself. And I wonder how many of us that really hit home this year. Like the way we taught music looked totally different, but it was about those students, those musicians, those people. And so we are teaching excellence, we're teaching commitment, but first and foremost, we're teaching people. And um, Chris Selby, the job of teaching is less about feeding information to students and more about making them hungry. So, um, think about right now, do you have a favorite quote or something you end up saying to your kids over and over and over and over that you can share with us? Uh, um, you know, for, uh, Kurt, Kurt Moss is the, um, the music is, um, uh, you while it lasts, uh, you are the music while it lasts, um, you know, David Eccles, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that counts, that's Winston Churchill, music is what happens between the notes, I love that, throw me in some quotes, I'm a quote lover, I love these. Mistakes are proof that you're trying. I love that. What else really inspires you or you find yourself saying to your kids over and over and over? One thing I end up saying to my kids over and over is, um, you know, we are going to do more than play notes. We're going to, we're going to make music. We're going to play with passion, precision, and unity. Turn your camera on. I love that one. <laughs> A little bit of realism there. Practice makes better, you know, yes, for all of us perfectionists out there, um, you know, having a, a, a great attitude about enjoying the journey and the process and not just the product is really uh, one. If you make a mistake, make it a strong one. Awesome. Keep those coming. I really love those. So I'll show you one of my favorite ones. I'm a, definitely a big Brene Brown fan and it's about, you know, all of us are jumping in there and I'm... Uh, this year jumping back into the arena after a pretty tough year and so I have to remind myself it's not the critic who counts not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood who strives valiantly who errs who comes short again and again who spends himself in a worthy cause who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. So as you go back this year, I encourage you to dare greatly 
And remember, it's not the critics that count because there will always be a dime a dozen. Uh, we're going to jump right in there. Uh, we're going to we're going to have a lot of success, but we're going to we're going to stumble sometimes too. And um, but we know the work we're doing is important. So there's tons of these quotes and philosophies and, and how people plan. But then there's a lot in this book about the nitty gritty of um, actual strategies for different areas. So, for instance, um, when it comes to warm up, um, do you see any of these books on the screen that you use in the warm up? If you do, put it in the chat. A lot of them mentioned using Habits of a Successful String Musician, Daily Warm-Ups by Michael Allen. A lot of people mentioned going through, taking their students through the finger patterns, you know, the one, two, two, three, three, four, open, Spock, those born off finger patterns and drills, and of course scales and arpeggios. Um, but if you're looking for some materials, those were very popular amongst our pa panelists. Um, the warm-up for most of these people, it was teaching time. I will say this, for everybody that I read, it was not, let's just play a scale to play a scale. It was, there was a very specific objective for everything in the warm-up. It, whether it was, um, you know, developing a specific left-hand skill or right-hand skill or developing the ear or musicianship or something about the instrument, it was very intentional. So, and it was usually tied to the repertoire. So if in the repertoire, you were gonna be working on an excerpt where people were gonna be struggling with spiccato, then it wasn't just rote scales that day. It was some specific bow work and bow hand work and, 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 and spiccato work and things that tied to that repertoire or things that tied to what their goals were of exactly, they had very clear in mind, this is where I want my students to be next week at the end of this nine weeks, at the end of this year, realizing that we all have to adjust for kids where they are. If you're uh, really looking for the um, skill developed sequences and you haven't seen the ASTA curriculum, those are some great places to look for uh, specific skills that, you know, a lot of people talked about how teaching time and warm up time uh, was a time where they taught skills. So then when they got to the repertoire, they could really focus on making music and, and doing that mu music making aspect together. So let's do a little bit of this. Um, first of all, um, you know, uh, healthy playing. One thing this pandemic has taught us is that, um, you know, it's, it's really good to just think about the notes and the rhythms of that repertoire, but what about the whole child? What about the whole person? What about the healthy, the healthy musician of mind and body? So, um, you know, Kathy Hudnell has in here some great suggestions. She does warm-ups with her kids every day. So if you want to do them with me, just stretch to the sky. Don't underestimate the power of these stretches to... Uh, really get rid of that tension and let's just take our elbows and hook them and go left and go right let's just shake away the whole tension of the day it's been a long day roll your head a little bit gently let's take our our shoulders and just come up to our ears now roll backwards until you get like a flat shelf you know I try to teach students that um, tension is the enemy of good string playing, not just because we enter ourselves, okay, but it inhibits. There's so many problems in the in our oral um, work and our products and our ensemble playing that are just caused by this tension and lack of body alignment. So don't underestimate the stretching. You know, uh, two or three minutes or 30 seconds of stretching, anything is going to help get people out of their regular mundane world and bring them here present in the moment to, so they're ready, body and mind, to do some great music making. Another thing I'll tell you is that I've seen a lot of people, anybody here use backing tracks to play along with your scales or your etudes or anything like that? Put it in the chat. We have, um, we have um, David Eccles, who, um, who does some uh, really great um, warm-ups with his kids where he, pro he provides a harmonic context to, um, to what he's playing. And what he does is he has the kids 
um, play along with a backing track, something like, let's see if I can get this to play for you. Okay, share. Can you guys hear this? If you can hear that, just put me a yes in the chat. thing to do I'd say you know a lot of creative ideas that people shared in this um, in this book another one that people shared was the um, the idea um, oh I love this is that sometimes the kids ears just go on autopilot because they're hearing Western music all the time and that is why not have them really learn to listen attentively and adjust their intonation by putting them in a non-Western key. So uh, I'm probably not going to explain this as well as Kirk Moss does because he does it, but he'll be around here in the Q&A if you want. But here's a, here's a, uh, it's called a toxema. I hope I'm saying that right. It's you basically can put on a drone and have a non-metrical improvisation over it. And it forces, if you're in one of these modes, the kids to really listen to the actual in intervals. So, um, so for instance, let's say we're in A Phrygian. You might just start with your tuning note A, just droning in the room. And you might ask the kids just to uh, start simply with two or three pitches, like A, B flat, or C. One person plays a pattern and everybody echoes back. how these long sustained other uh, non-western things really make you listen in a different way you can then expand it out even have kids do it with their eyes closed you can do all the way up that a phrygian thinking about creative things to do um, that are really going to get your kids out of a rut that not everything has to be you know western art music it can be um, you can use modes you can use all these different creative things that will really wake them up uh, lots of people in talked about warming up with um, teaching ear, sk ear skills uh, for instance Kurt Kurt Mosier actually has his kids play simple folk songs by ear and improvise the harmonies. This just blew my mind, the sequence that he does leading up to that. Uh, Kristen Heron does this thing where they'll be playing along on the scale, and if he stops, everybody will stop, and instead of playing the next note with their instrument, everybody will sing it. So, for instance... <laughs> Getting the kids singing and, and gamifying it, um, the, the point for him is that you can't play in tune if you don't have the note in your head before you play it. Otherwise, you're just accepting whatever is coming out of the instrument. So really working on that audiation. And so there are lots of good tips in there on that. Um, how many of you in the chat 
um, say that you use Habits of a Successful Stream Musician. This has got a lot of really interesting things to help teach articulation and intonation, especially if you haven't seen the tuning canons or different exercises that take bowings or articulations and do them in every key so that like, let's say uh, the middle level book is equally fantastic, awesome. So let's say you're working on a piece that's in, you know, A major and you're working on spiccato you can just take these exercises, put it as a warm up right into the um, book. But uh, what I hear from not only Chris Selby, uh, but also from a lot of the other authors is, is that they're taking whatever they're working on in the repertoire and they'll do it in the warm up first. Um, first, without reading it all, take the eyes out of it, just break it down to an open string. Then after that, work it into an exercise, like on a simple folk song or a scale, and then have them apply it by playing some exercises like this. By the time you get to that excerpt, they've already practiced the skills several times. Um, one thing I really um, like about these is that we're talking about really sequential development. And especially, you know, um, you know the method books, uh, Essential Elements 1, 2, and 3, or whatever method book you're using, that's great up into a certain level but once you get past that you know some people use the essential techniques which is really great but you know all of these higher level skills you kind of need something and these are great resources now um one thing that i love that chris selby mentioned that he did was you know he'll take some of these exercises in here and he'll have a different student leader um lead it every time so he can get off the podium and he can walk around um, so, for instance, he's found a lot of his intonation issues are caused by things that are posture or instrument related. So, people not having things situated with a chin rest or a shoulder rest right here or this angle really messes up the left hand or, you know, end pins for cellists that are just not set up right. And those are causing uh, the root problems of these intonation and tone problems have more to do with how the students have grown over the years and how now the instrument is set up in relation to them where they have stress or tension or just things they can't reach. And so he gets off of the podium and he walks around and he just helps individuals, you know, adjust things. And so it's a great way to get off of the podium. And so um, there's some really good sequences in there. So um, now just quickly, um, that was the biggest category because I figured, you know, I hear so many people thinking they want extra warm-ups or um, um, in the school orchestra teachers group, what warm-up can I do? Um, but I also want to share a couple of pointers on intonation. Uh, for instance, um, Creston Heron actually talks a lot about when it comes to intonation, we need to let students explore and discover how it's supposed to sound and feel and not just tell them what to do um, because whether it's shifting or something else you can still be correcting those mistakes in the 50 second rehearsal that if they don't understand the why behind what they're doing if they don't understand it conceptually and so um you can do this little one with me um just take your just take your left hand and let's say you're holding a violin or viola out in front of you as if you are wrapping your hand around the scroll. Okay, now take your um, fingers and just touch your shoulder. Scroll, shoulder, scroll, shoulder. Do you feel that when you're going towards the scroll, it's a little lower than when you go up to your shoulder? Most people feel that. Some people don't, but most people do. Now, what he asked them to do, experiment number two, we're gonna do the same thing, except we're gonna take our elbow and we're gonna point it forward like towards our belly button. And now just go scroll, shoulder, scroll, shoulder. You feel how that's much more level? So um, this, this gets students to realize the importance of when you shift you can't have a lot of friction in your hands. So you not only have to let go, but it also matters the big picture of what not just your hand is doing, but what your arm is doing and how it's all located. And, and why is this less uphill? Is it easier to slide um, and, and get to those notes when you don't have to fight gravity by going uphill? That once again goes back to the body posture. Okay, let me see you shift. 
going uphill like this, okay? Same thing. Now, let me see it, you know, with your scroll level or leaning your shoulders back. What was easier? What sounded better? So it's more about building awareness and asking them questions and just say, do this or don't do that, okay? Um, and another thing um, that that Charles Louts has found helps a lot of his students is to, especially if they're having trouble with their fourth fingers, uh, can you put in the chat if your students have a lot of trouble playing fourth fingers in tune or um, resist playing it within with every ounce of their being? I know uh, that's happened to my students a lot, but he, uh, Charles Louts talks about a lot how the, the box, the square on the first finger, um, if that's not set and high enough, it actually causes all kinds of problems in the in the fourth finger of the hand. And so um, just getting that first finger into the box can help you uh, reach other things. Now, um, he also, like so many of these panelists mentioned using the finger patterns. Um, so uh, everybody just do the one, two pattern for me. That's where the half step is or the two, three. Or the three four or the apart or the spock but one thing that was really interesting to me was that he has these posted on a giant poster in the front of his room and then when uh, students are playing pieces um, they will color say they got the color coded patterns not just the actual visual so let's say now you are playing a piece in G major and people keep missing the C naturals well, they can just use a yellow highlighter to mark that half step as a one-two pattern for that measure. Or, um, you know, they're playing, uh, uh, you know, in B-flat major on the A string, upper strings, and, you know, they're really not stretching those third fingers high enough or getting that tight enough half step between three and four. You know, you can take an orange highlighter that correlates to the actual patterns, makes it super concrete. So I just really loved really love that um that idea as well when it came to tone so many people whether they talked about like david eccles talked about the holy trinity of of tone production being contact point bow speed and arm weight and he has this graphic in his his classroom or creston heron the four bananas of tone production um, or from the ASTA curriculum in Charles Louts, weight, angle, speed, and point of contact. And the P is square because point of contact both means where the bow is placed in which part of the bow, frog middle tip. Point of contact also means, you know, if it's in lane one, two, three, four, five, close to the bridge or the fingerboard. But the uniting thing with tone and how lots of folks taught it and expression was that they all taught kids very specifically to manipulate each of the variables within a warm-up before they ever applied it to the actual music. So, um, and they made it as concrete as possible. So, okay, let me hear your D string with um, 10 pounds of weight, 20 pounds of weight, 30 pounds of weight, 80 pounds of weight. Saying weight instead of um, pressure really helps them not to get too tense um with the speed okay let me hear this um let's let's do 50 miles an hour on the bow let's do 10 miles an hour on the bow um and lanes one being close to the bridge or five being at the fingerboard okay this part where do you think is going to create a really soft and uh wispy sound okay so now they're making artistic decisions okay well i think i would use lane one Okay, how much bow speed do you think you would use? How much weight? So you involve them in making the artistic sounds and experiment with, experimenting with the sounds and seeing what they sound like. So that by the time you get to a place where you can say, uh, let's do this in the middle of the bow, 20, uh, 20 pounds of bow weight, um, you know, bow speed, um, you know, 20 miles an hour in lane five. You're getting a very specific unified sound. And um, one thing I really love with uh, Charles Lauk said was he can say, he, he takes the number line and superimposes it over the bows. So for instance, this is, and he got this from Dan Long. This is number one. This is number 100. 
Okay, everybody place your bow on the string at 50. Now place it at 25. Now place it at one. Now place it at 100. Okay, we're gonna play this part and I only want you to go from 50 to 100. Okay, I want you to go from one to 50 in the number line. Okay, I want you to go from one to 100. So, you know, lots of times we're just yelling more bow, more bow, more bow. Um, but that's really inhibited uh, by how much confidence the kid has, right? Um, you know, Laura Thomas talks about how, you know, playing out with a huge sound often has more to do with their confidence. But when you can get them to be thinking specifically, oh, I need to start in the middle of the bow and we're going to, I have to get from 50 to 100. Um, I only have two beats to do it. So they start thinking mathematically and, and they get out of their own mind and out of their own way. So uh, number lines on the bow are a really fun thing to do as well. When it comes to ensemble, um, everybody in the world should talk to Charles, um, should talk to Scott Laird about what he calls essence. This changed some of my thinking and I found this creeping into my own practice already after reading it. This is the idea about positive, every student make, makes only positive contributions to the group. And they do it at whatever they can do at that moment, whatever their level is. And it's about individual empowerment because the students have to be able to make their own decisions about what they can contribute well at a given time. So we only contribute to the group what makes positive sound or positive impact. And we don't contribute wrong notes, wrong rhythms. We play what we can that contributes to the essence especially in the rehearsals. It's not about giving kids a break and dumbing down the music. Um, it's about um, that every rehearsal, he wants them walking out of the rehearsal knowing that they made a, a positive contribution. So for instance, if it's a group of 16th notes and they know they cannot play all of those in tune, you know, um, or in time, uh, rather than slow down the whole orchestra for the first three or four rehearsals, they might only be playing the first of every four and then the, the two of every four or quarter notes. But they are only contributing that to the group, which is going to make the group sound better. So when they walk out, they feel good about what they played and what they contributed. Uh, when kids are playing wrong notes and wrong rhythms and things that they can't play and they're not making those decisions, um, they feel badly about what they did. I mean, they know they're going into a concert where they're not going to be able to do it. And, you know, 90% of the students are going to go into the concert having, after having heard or seen whatever bowing it is uh, a, a, a hundred times, they're going to catch on to it. Uh, but in the meantime, what is their process like and what does it feel like? So I highly encourage you to go to Scott Laird's blog and read about essence because it will it will literally change the way you think about some things that we do in string education. Um, you know, approaching things in rehearsal with our ensemble as positive problem solving and not from a judgment standpoint sometimes is huge. I know, you know, um, the students just play until they mess up and we correct them is is really feels bad a lot of times. But when you say what's the issue with this part? How can I help you get this? Or, hey, let's have circle day today. Um, I'm going to break the class into four or five ensembles. You sit in a circle. I'm going to assign you each a certain number of measures. You have this long, and then you're going to perform it for the class uh, so that the kids take ownership of what they're doing. Um, I love um, Torture by Metronome from Gail Barnes, uh, which is where if the kids are rushing, She'll stop them and turn the metronome down five clicks. And after much of frustration and, um, and amusement, every time they do it, they'll go slower and slower. They eventually will really uh, get to uh, a nice steady awareness of where that's got to go. And it gamifies it as well. Um, you know, this year we're going to be going back and we're going to have to build a lot of community. Um, and if you have a chance to read some of the stuff, Laura Mulligan Thomas, that it's all about the relationships and the kids and um, being a part of the whole community. Uh, it's about a positive culture. Chris Selby has this hanging in every classroom he teaches in. 
And look at these habits of being. I'm really, I'm really, uh, I think it's nice that it's about show up rested and prepared. Um, pay attention to the people around you, their thoughts, feelings, and responses inside of you. It becomes about awareness of self and others and what you bring to the community. Stuff about breathing and learning and doing your job without apologies, excuses, exceptions, or complaints. That can change the culture. Be yourself, your best self, even if no one else is noticing. But look at these. Practice forgiveness. Practice gratitude. Practice kindness. Practice happiness. Um, and, and, you know, these kinds of things, when you have a positive culture, it is contagious. Um, if you have a chance to log on to the website for Klein High School, get on there and you will be amazed at all the stuff that they do as a community. Um, they connect the schools from the elementary to the, I have a connecting apparatus across all the schools. Um, he goes to the instrument tryouts, so they see him from day one. They go out and they volunteer uh, in the community. They have a parent orchestra where the parents can learn how to play instruments along with the kids. They have a scholarship program for their kids. Um, some of these things just blew my mind. Um, so if you have a chance to look into that, I think it's really inspiring. And, um, you know, this is hard for some of us to hear, but it's not about us, right? Ego's the enemy and caring is king. It's really about those kids. And I think, um, you know, Scott Laird writes about how he was really in, in kind of a bad mental spot, like not enjoying his job as much as he could. And then he read all of these inspirational books and really thought about what he was doing. And you should read his story in his own words because it's very compelling. I mean, I know a lot of us have probably felt some distress or burnout in, um, in, in, in recent months. But then he talks about how he has really changed to a different model and what he's doing. He's, it's really about servant leadership and leading with love. And once we've been around long enough, we're going to realize our whole reputation is not built on whether this one kid's playing the B-flat too high or if they miss one of our rehearsals, but we destroy their love of music. And so it's about servant leadership, not, um, you know, the students are here to serve me, but I'm there to serve them. So I'm going to ask you about your year, your 2021. Okay, what's it going to look like? I urge you to think big. I urge you to look at it as a blank slate, and and what story are you going to write for you and your your students this year? What are the new things you'd like to try? What are you going to do to dare greatly, to really seize those opportunities, and not worry so much about the critics who are always going to be there? We know that failure is not fatal, and it's the courage to continue that counts. And all of us getting back up and getting into this thing after last year, that is where our courage is. Um, to make a resolution and act accordingly is to live with hope. Hope, I think, is something that we can all use during these days. There might be difficulties and hardships, but not disappointment or despair if you follow the path steadily. Do not rest in your efforts without stopping, without haste. Carefully take a step at a time and surely you will get there. I love that quote by Suzuki and uh, that's where Scott Laird is in his mental state right now is where you know I'm just going to take every day I'm just going to take one step and the path to the end will eventually take care of itself and so I'll close with this and we'll go to our Q&A and it's um, as we wrote the chapters of this book the world really seemed to go awry it was consumed by a deadly pandemic, riddled with social unrest, plagued with racial injustice, and bitterly divided by its politics. We each escaped to our classrooms and tried to offer the best experiences we could for our students. Looking back at these unprecedented times together, I don't think there has ever been a world more in need of what music has to offer, and therefore, there has never been a world more in need of what music teachers have to offer. In the midst of the chaos and the uncertainty, we gave our students a place to thrive, a place to connect, a place to belong, and a place to express all that cannot be expressed by words alone, but cannot remain unsaid. This is what we do as teachers. 
for many of the young people we will see this year. Music is the light that is helping them navigate those times, these times. We are the vessels for that light. And I'm reminded of the following lines from Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem, The Hill We Climb. For there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. So I wish you, as you write your story this year, a great year and a great chance to make a difference in your students' lives. Thank you so much for coming. I want to do a Q&A now and then give away a book. So can we bring our panelists yes. on? Yes, yes, and thank you so much, Sandy. We'll have Kirk, Laura, and Kathy turn their cameras and mics on. Thank you for waiting patiently. And uh, just a, uh, a quick uh, announcement to all of the attendees. Uh, I don't see any questions currently in the Q&A area. So uh, I'm just going to have, while, while we get some questions in there, please, please type out some questions, any questions you might have. Uh, but maybe we could just have uh, Kirk, Laura, and Kathy speak just very, very briefly about what they contributed to the book, uh, if that would work while we're waiting for some questions. So Kirk, let's go ahead and start with you. Well, it was just a great, to be a part of the team and and even to see some of the participants here in in the uh, webinar session it's exciting because knowing the work that they're doing in the classrooms is is what gets i think all of us excited but to follow up sandy on the story of the the talk theme uh, i was working with an honor orchestra and we decided that we would open it things were going well and smoothly and so we began working on these improvisation exercises out of the tuning routine using the A just as you demonstrated. And so we opened the concert with it without telling the audience. And so the A came and, and then as the students tuned, then improvisation started happening. Students would stand up and began improvising. And then we kind of created a piece out of it and it went. And, and one of the first students to stand up and we had rehearsed all this, of course, you know, so they were, they were prepared, they knew the order, was the second to last chair violist. Now she is standing up in a ballroom with like 500 people and she is playing her heart out. And afterwards, after the honor orchestra concert, after all the, the big pieces and show pieces and everything, the parents and the student came up and spoke with me. And here every night after rehearsal, of course, all day rehearsals, rehearsals, you know, forever for these things. And, and she would go home, put the drone on and practice improvising. And it's what got her into playing the music was being creative. And in the traditional form, she just couldn't you know, express. And her parents, the joy that her parents felt and the joy that she felt because all this creativity that had been kind of pent up inside her was able to be released in that moment. And, and also just what a great reminder because you know, she was like sitting, you know, second to last chair. You know, she's probably the one we as teachers would all be getting around, go, well, should we let her in? Shouldn't we let her in? You know, and, and here's a student who's going to take that experience away. So it's those moments that that sometimes are planned, um, but sometimes are uh, just emerge from the creativity of playing a string instrument. And, and it's what all these panelists do, but it's also uh, those of you participating, too. So I, I just get excited to be in this group. Thank you so much, Kirk. Uh, Laura, let's go to you, or your contribution to the to the book. And we do have at least one or two questions coming in. Well, I'm, I'm really a fortunate person. Uh, my mother says I lived up, I was born under a lucky star. I got my first job in Charlottesville and I've been here for next year will be my 40th year. So this is my one and only um, job other than waiting tables in high school. <laughs> so. I've been in this one community and, you know, started with the kind of a small program and now, um, you know, and I, uh, well, we can talk about before COVID and COVID, but, um, you know, prior to COVID, we were on a roll. We had gone to Europe five times to concertize and uh, we were due to go to the International uh, Youth Music Festival in Portugal in June, 2020. So um, we're, you know, highly respected program. We win more than the football team does in Charlottesville. So, and, we, and we're also sort of an only child because the uh, we're a school division with one high school. So resources can come our way and don't have to be shared with multiple other high schools. So I'm in a really unique situation. I'm totally aware of that. Um, but I wanna um, 
I want to tell you what sparked my um, ideas and, and enthusiasm for building a program. Uh, I read an article about Bill Scott in Spartanburg, South Carolina, when I was in high school, um, maybe in college. So way back in the late 70s, early 80s. And the article was something about um, how he's got football players in his orchestra. And I just thought that is the coolest thing ever. And somehow, um, you know, by, by hook or by crook, my program developed to that point where we've got just everybody in it, just got kids from all different subsections and communities. And, and uh, these are kids who do sports and do, you know, the academic team, but also kids who rap on the side and do whatever. Um, so to me, the, mo the, the biggest, um, when I look back on my career, I think about the community that's been founded. The, I think about the CHS orchestra community and how it is a safe place for kids, how they hang out in the orchestra room, how they love to be um, in our space. And I guess, Sandy, when you, you know, sent out these questions and I thought about specific techniques and what I did here or there, but big picture, I think the most important thing is the sense of community that is established in the room so that the kids come in every day and say, I want to be here. My teacher loves to see me. She's excited that I'm here. Um, you know, she's super jazzed about some new piece she's throwing at us. And boy, I don't know if I can play it, but I'm going to try because she thinks we can do it. So I don't know. There's just, just some big picture thoughts I had about rehearsing the high school orchestra. I think the the sense of community and the the tone and environment and um, I don't know, there's so much that goes into it. And and the technique kind of falls within. It's like if you think musically of a of a phrase, if you're thinking of a phrase musically, then some of the technical things fall into place. And that's kind of how I feel about um, my program or about any high school program is that when the big picture's there, the little things will fall into place. And uh, Laura, I love how you shared your story about how you built this program. And it was obvious, I mean, when you listen to you, it's obvious you love your kids and you love the program. And so if there's one thing I can say to everybody that really spoke to me in what you wrote, and that is tell your story. Like every, uh, you know, from the beginning to the end, whenever the kids are doing something great, it's always in the local newspaper in Charlottesburg, uh, Charlottesville. It's on the website. It is in the school newspaper. It is up on flyers in the school. Like, tell your story because perception is reality. And when your whole school and your whole community thinks, man, that I don't know what's going on in that orchestra, but uh, there's always something great going on. Like, there's your excellence right there. I agree. Thank you so much, Laura. I appreciate that. And then Kathy, how about you? Oh, I think you might be muted still, Kathy. <laughs> Welcome to last year. Uh -huh. um, Absolutely. So, hello, everybody. I am just really honored to be a part of this panel and to be a part of Sandy's book. Um, if I were to take from the past two panel members, I would say if you've ever listen to Kirk, you know that he is passionate about what he does. I think that if you can take your love of playing, of being a part of music, of directing, of whatever it is that you feel passionate about and translate that to your kids. And that's a part, Sandy, I think of telling your story um, because it's your story that's brought you to where you are right now as a teacher. And it's the good stuff and it's the bad stuff. And if kids know that you are passionate, not just about your subject matter, but about them, you know, and, and some of those quotes that you pulled in tonight from Scott Laird and others about, you know, it's not about a perfect performance. It's about enjoying making music. It's about learning. It's about achieving it's about setting goals together and as laura said as a community and what you are what you're doing and it doesn't matter what your teaching situation is um, whether it's a, <clears throat> a really small program 
or a large symphonic orchestra is building that community and building relationships with your kids, letting them build relationships with each other, you know, uh, finding a way to make a connection with your kids and having your program make that connection with the community. And that's what's going to build success. And I've been in so many different kind of teaching situations by now, um, including, you know, building a, a program in Pickens County, South Carolina, and starting it from the ground up. Um, and Bill Scott, whom you mentioned, uh, was one of my mentors for that. Pam Telejohn was another one of my mentors. And I basically was right out of college, went to them and said, tell me exactly what to do and I will do it. And they did. And, you know, it made it very successful. Uh, most of my career has been in Gwinnett County, Georgia. And um, I've not been in one school, but I've been in, you know, several school settings. Um, I had an experience in Hawaii where I, I taught for a year in a school in Hawaii. And um, so I've, I've taught, I've taught on, in so many different kinds of teaching situations. And I think that if you, if you care about your kids and you teach them that they are important and that each person is important to the entire group, as well as their effort is important to the entire group, you're going to, you're going to find success. I, I bring to my work a special element of this healthy musicianship. And that's from my personal experience of, you know, injuring myself mm -hmm. and, and switching from performance to education. And um, anyway, I, I want kids to know that they can learn to play and enjoy it for the whole lives. Thank you so much, Kathy. Go ahead, Sandy. I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, and just listening to all the different perspectives that we all bring to it, it really drives home to me that one, reach out to all the great mentors that are around you. I mean, I'm hearing the connections here because I grew up in governor's school with Bill Scott. I student taught with Pam Taylor, John Hayes, and like the, the world is just so small, but if you ask these mentors, they have knowledge they will share. If get together with a group of your peers, you know, get a coffee chat going and share your ideas because there's so much expertise in every school district where we are, get together with your teachers. And um, the, the thing that I really want you to walk away with is that when we share our stories, is that we broaden our horizons. And it reminds me of the anecdote of Kurt Vonnegut, how he was working in an archeological dig one summer. And, um, and the, the guy was making small talk with him. And he said, well, what do you do? Well, I play music or I do a little bit of that, but I quit because I'm not really good at it. And the guy goes, well, I never really thought that being good at something was the point of it. Look what, a, look what all these experiences you've had and how that's made you a better person and what you take into the world because you've done it. And so I, I, that's a thought I wanna leave with us that we teach all our kids, not just the best kids. And that is the point, yes, we all teach musical excellence because we want kids to have the skills and knowledge and expertise it takes to make music awesomely for a lifetime and love that music. But we also want them to enjoy every day that they're with us. And we want to be that light that they need and give them that place that they can belong. Thank you, Sandy. We have a, we have a, we did have a few questions come in really quick. So maybe we can do a rapid fire uh, Q and A, maybe 30 to 60 second answer, which some of these I think will be able to do that. But the first one is from Justin and it's any suggestions on how to start a parent organization or resources for doing it. Mine has fallen apart and I need to get it going. Um, I will say GIA publishes a couple of books about um, starting a parent organization uh, by David Vandewalker, which are excellent uh, if you're interested. But uh, I'm gonna turn it over to first Sandy and then anyone on the panel who may have a, a suggestion. First I'll say is just reach out to people that are knocking it out of the park. I mean, reach out to Laura Mulligan Thomas, reach out to Aunt Kathy Hudnell, reach out to Creston Hare and get on that website for the Klein High School. Um, you know, all of the folks that you see in the, they want to share their ideas. And that's the best way is to, because it's longer, it's going to take longer than a few seconds to talk about that. But it is so important for your, uh, for your teaching and for your support. Thank you so much, Sandy. 
Kirk, Laura, or Kathy, anything to contribute to that? Yeah, Laura. Oh, and you're muted, Laura. Darn, I was batting, batting a thousand. I know, I know. Um, I, I have found that I needed to tap somebody and ask them to, um, to step up. You know, it's not like we have 10 people who are vying for this position of volunteer coordinator or your president or whatever you're going to call it. I would look and see who, you know, the people who volunteer the most frequently, you know, who are showing some leadership, who have ideas about what they, you know, like to see the orchestra do. Um, I would tap them, have a conversation with them, take them a coffee, um, state what your needs are, what you'd like to see happen. And, um, and I think parents will step up, but it, it, it doesn't just happen. You really do have to make the request. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, let me ask the next question I see here. Uh, what is your absolute favorite concert programming for a younger high school group, especially after a year of virtual learning? So uh, any, anyone, anyone can go ahead and, and take that. Go ahead, Kathy. I'm not sure I have a favorite, but what I would do is find out where they are at the beginning of the year and, and don't over program. I would program okay. to their strengths, you know, even if it, even for that first concert, you want to stretch them, but after the year that we've had, you also want to make them feel like they still know how to play. Mm -hmm. So I would gear to actually gear a little bit down for that first concert this year and make sure that they have a voice in what you're picking. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great. Laura or Kirk, did you either of you have anything? The, the orchestration, I think, is going to be more important than ever coming out of the pandemic, where, where if you've got those single lines with single independent rhythms going on in every single line, and you're getting back together for the first time, you know, I would certainly be looking for things that are more doubled, that have a little more security built into the orchestration to build those students' confidence back up as they get back together. I did some clinics after spring break, after in programs that had just gotten back together for the first time in their actual orchestras and not in their cohorts or anything else. And it was just, it was just a, a real celebration to be back together. And so to have repertoire that kind of represents that we're back together and we're playing together moment, I think it's just gonna be really powerful. Great, great. Thank you so much. Uh, let me go ahead and move on to the last question we have in our Q&A panel here. Uh, this uh, Rochelle says, I teach at a church school and have a hard time finding religious and sacred repertoire. Does anyone have any links or resources where I could find arrangements for high school players? Um, she suggests maybe Pepper or other sites for more advanced musicians. Anything to offer on that front? Nothing. We have crickets. We have crickets. Corrals, corrals, I would I would say would be one place you could start. Okay. Where you might be starting anyway at the beginning of the year for tone production, but you know, that that would be my best suggestion. Great. Also, yeah. I would say don't be afraid if you're not seeing what you have out there that you really want and your kids need. Um, you know, there's some articles out there about, you know, quick ways to do some quick and dirty arrangements of your own things that you can, I mean, don't be afraid to like take some hymns that everybody's going to know or um, take, you know, let them vote on something they really want to play and commission a composer to come in and do a concert with you. You can have a guest artist, can be a really special experience. Um, I, I have seen some, but I, I'm with you. They're really few and far between. But I would say you don't have to be a huge program to um, to actually have somebody come in and, and write something for your kids or to get on there and, and read a few things and just be able to write out something in one of the um, notation programs easily for your students, especially if you have multi-level all at the same time. Uh, sometimes that's your best bet is just getting in there and, you know, be creative. I mean, we're, we're all not just players, but we're, you know, we're creative musicians and that's just another part of it. Like I, you may enjoy it.
Yeah, wonderful. I really appreciate that, Sandy. Well, uh, I think that we, we've, we've wrapped up. Uh, we're out of time at this point. Thank you to everybody who has joined us this evening, the attendees, and a big thank you to Sandy and Kirk and Laura and Kathy for offering your insights and your passion. Um, just as I mentioned, uh, this was recorded, and so it's going to go up on our Facebook and YouTube pages here in the next few days. And don't forget about the uh, promo code ORCHESTRA15 for 15% 15 off the book. So with that, thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. I'm putting a link to book. If you would like to buy one, I'm putting it in the chat over there. So go ahead okay. over to GIA if you would like to get your own copy because these folks, I don't brag on myself, but these folks are amazing. So All right. <laughs> have a good night. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.